Hey guys, I'm your host Christina and we're here with more fun before the gathering begins. This week for the semi-finals we have green versus black. Let's see what game they're gonna play. Pucker up. Pucker up. Each team will move balls from their table to a bowl. The team that moves the most balls in one minute wins. The catch is they can only use their mouths. And don't worry, they're married. In five, four, three, two, one, begin. Oh man, oh man. <laughs> oh, come on green team, you guys got this. Way to go, green team. They just killed it. Um, we'll see you guys next week for another semi-final round. It was super fun doing that. And I just want to say, whether you're online or in this gathering in person, thank you so much for being here and honoring God with your time this morning. Well, hey, if you would stand with us, we are going to go ahead into a time of worship. Uh, Jesus is so worthy of our praise. He is so worthy of our adoration. And so as we go into worship, can we just pour out our love and our worship to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords this morning? Good morning, True Grace. Let's put our hands together.
this morning, whether it's up or down. The sacrifice of praise is something God can do.
Sergeant Geary, and I am. <clears throat> I've been given the pleasure, the honor, really, to stand in the gap for our veterans in prayer today. And I'm in a very unique position because I'm at that door from going from a service member to a veteran. And that door is a very scary door. That door is a door, and on the other side, on the other side, there's giants. Giants of thoughts of suicide, giants of thoughts of worthlessness, giants of the pain of war and loss. And I know so many before me have, have walked through this door and had to, had to battle these same giants, but I want to today and from this day forward inspire you to stand in the gap for our veterans to help us to help us stop losing them 20 a day let's pray God I thank you so much for this opportunity God I thank you so much for just allowing me to serve and allowing all our, our service members to serve our great nation and God I ask you right now to stand in the gap I ask you right now to, to meet them at their lowest point, God, and pick them up. God, I ask you right now to find them <clears throat> at two in the morning when they're woken up, overwhelmed with loss. I ask you to find them when they're alone and they have no one and be that peace. Help them to feel your love. When they take a knee, be the water that they drink to replenish their soul so they can get up and they can fight back with a new vigor. Give them the strength of David to come at these giants and slay every one of them, God. I pray, God, for the families that are holding a folded up flag, God. I pray that you will comfort them every single day, God. You will be their strength and the love that was, that's not there anymore, God. I pray, God, that you would just comfort them, comfort our, our service members that are serving right now, God. As they put this mission first, as they put their family to the side, as they put their kids to the side, as they put everything else to the side except for the mission. God, I pray you be the, the strength there, the bridge that doesn't allow that family to be torn apart because of the military. And God, I thank you so much for our free and wonderful nation, God. I thank you that you will touch our leaders and help them, God, to bring peace. God, I pray that you, God, overcome this enemy that is strife and, and God, riots and anger. God, I pray that you help us overcome it, God. And I thank you so much for the opportunity to stand in the gap for those who are struggling. We love you, Lord God. Thank you so much. In our name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you guys for the opportunity and shake, air shake hands or air high five. Here's my air high five to those of you at home. I appreciate you guys letting me pray for you. Hey, True Grace. Hey, we heard from our food bank that um, there's a real practical way that you can serve our city. And during the holidays, there's a lot of people that are looking to do a lot of baking. And so we would love to really just kind of overwhelm our food bank with five pound bags of sugar. Uh, they said sugar is one of the things that they're lacking and they need. And what a simple thing for each one of us to just pick up maybe a five pound bag of sugar, or a couple of five pound bags of sugar at the grocery store. So if you want to bring that in, you can drop it directly at the food bank on Wednesday mornings or Sunday mornings, or you can also bring it by the church and we'll make sure it gets there. Um, this is also the time of year where we do our, what we call our holiday food project or our benevolence giving for families in need. In our church, we have about 30 families, and the holidays are going to be difficult this year. And so if you can give to the Holiday Food Project, there should be an envelope in front of you if you're in the live gathering, 
or um, if you are watching online or just any time during your week, you can also give and just mark your offering, Holiday Food Project or Benevolence, and it's gonna help make that happen. And here's the reality, there's, there's a lot of us that financially, this year hasn't changed too much of our lives yet. We haven't been as affected as others. And if that's your story, let's make sure that we do something special uh, to end this year by really being a blessing to those who are far more affected by the economy and by the pandemic than we are, all right? Um, also, don't, I don't want to forget, there is a women's uh, brunch coming up, the Christmas brunch. And if you'd like to host a table for that, I know a lot of you have been to this event and, and it's just a beautiful time. If you'd like to host a table, would you go online and register for that? We need to make sure that every table is covered with somebody that's going to host it and help make that event happen. Finally, it is the offering. And, you know, as we talked about finances just in the gathering last week, the, the thought that comes to me today is that God loves a cheerful giver. And when you give, I hope that as you give to the Lord, that you just feel like God is pleased with you. Almost like when you get baptized in water, like I'm doing what God said. And that obedience and that trust in Him just makes you just feel like I'm, I'm really doing it, you know, because so often we do struggle in life. And so I want to encourage you, when you give unto the Lord, would you give cheerfully, joyfully, just knowing that God is smiling and God is proud of you, that really money is not, you know, an idol for you. You got the money thing figured out. So I want to bless you as, as, as we give, can we? God, thank you for so many mature people who give to the work of the Lord because we know, God, really everything we have is yours. So God, you've given us these bodies, you've given us these jobs, you've given us our increase. And so Lord, we want to give back to you. Bless this offering and bless your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My name is Star Robison. I came to know Jesus the last couple years through Freedom Session. The more I pushed against him, the more he realized that uh, he is there for me. And I want to be baptized because I want to help people who are hurting come to know Jesus in their own time. My name is Alex. I came to know Jesus just by coming to church with my grandma and grandpa. I'm really excited for my grandma to see me get baptized because she has always believed in me and the reason why I want to be baptized is because it's taking my relationship with Jesus farther. My name's Cheyenne Stroman. I kind of always grew up around the church. I never really knew Jesus until recently. I had a really uh, bad mental state and I felt his peace um, after talking to somebody who was a Christian. And so I started getting into the word and uh, building a relationship with him and it has been a game changer. <laughs> I'm getting baptized because I want to show my public um, proclamation of my relationship with Jesus and hopefully um, it'll help strengthen my walk as well. Wow. Good morning. <laughs> Man, whoever's idea it was to have Miguel pray, good idea. Uh, that was fantastic, man. I love uh, authentic prayer like that. Uh, geez, it's been a week, hasn't it? What a wonderful week. People said, How, how's the week going? I started thinking about it. I was like, well, we have this nation divided because of this election. And then we have this pandemic going on. But, you know, that brought us some darkness. But then the time change happened. So that brought some darkness. And then it started raining. But other than that, it's been a great week, right? <laughs> I mean, the time change is enough for me. The rain is enough for me. The pandemic is more than enough. And, and all the chaos of the election, I'm just like, wow, God. And we sang a song today that was talking about out of the darkness. And um, one of the things I've learned about the darkness is that though there may be like, you know, the darkness may last for a night, there's joy that comes in the morning. And darkness is always a window. We've been through dark seasons, dark seasons, dark seasons. But you know what? Every time we've been through a dark season, we come out of that window on the other side and there's light. And ultimately, we're going to end up in heaven where there's real light. And so, you know, maybe you're like me and you were kind of doing like one of these, like, this is not a fun week. I tell you what, I'm just, I'm better today. And I'm always better on Sunday because people are worshiping God, putting him in his rightful place and not taking God for granted. And so when God is just being praised, it just feels like the whole, you know, like life is being uplifted. 
Um, so I'm excited for that and what God is doing. And people getting baptized is incredible. Um, baptism is about starting over, being reborn, and living different. <laughs> And uh, the reality is this, um, there will be a time in your life where you need to dig deep and start over. For all of us, there's, there's at least a time or maybe several times, some of you have gone through a life-altering event and you have to stop and go, well, either we're going to start over or we're going to give up. We don't have a lot of options, so let's start over, let's dig deep, and let's uh, figure this out from here. Um, I want to welcome everybody watching online and from home, from everywhere. You look fantastic in your sweats there on the couch. <laughs> yeah, you're more comfortable than, than some of us who are here live. Um, and I, I love what we are doing right now. I love that we have live gatherings, and I love that we have, you know, this, this like online campus. It doesn't reach like another part of our city, like a second campus would. It reaches the world. And so today I'm grateful uh, for the internet. I know people who are sick and can't be, you know, here or have major issues with the pandemic that are very real. And I'm just so grateful for technology and what we're doing. Um, let me ask you a couple of questions. We're talking about recalibrate. It's our sixth uh, part of our series. The word recalibrate means to get back on track to work the way it was designed to work. To reset, to recenter, to refocus and to figure out, hey, where did we get a little bit off track? And let's get back on track um, so that our lives are working the way that God had intended when he created us in the first place. This week, we're talking about this phrase, recalibrate your legacy. Like the life that you're living and the legacy that will live on uh, beyond you, after you. And I want to start with a few questions. I want to ask you to really think through this. Here's the first one. What kind of legacy did your parents or grandparents leave you? Maybe it wasn't one of faith. Maybe it wasn't one of blessing. Maybe it was an incredible one of faith and blessing. Uh, what kind of legacy have you left in your life so far? What I love about that is that there's still time left. If you're still breathing, there's still time to leave a legacy. Amen? And then what changes do you need to make to leave the legacy that you really want to leave? There are times in my life I'm like, I don't like my tone, I don't like my attitude, I don't like the spirit of frustration, it's not who I want to be, I'm going to change it. Because I want to live a kind of life, I want to, I want to stop right now and consider how, how I'm living and I want, to, I want to live differently, I want to change uh, the dynamic right now. Somebody said this question when you think about your legacy, what do you want your people to say about you at your memorial service, uh, at your funeral? And I thought about that for a few minutes and I thought, well, I want people to say he was fun, I think that'd be kind of cool. I'd like people to say, um, I liked myself more when I was around Peter. He just brought out the best in me. I liked who I was when I was with him. I'd like people to say, God used him in my life. I'd like people to say, he believed in me, and I felt like he believed in me. Um, and then probably most of all, I'd like people to say, the love of Jesus just radiated out from him, from his eyes, from his countenance, from his words, uh, his spirit, the love of Jesus radiated out from him. There's some things I don't want to hear. Um, I wouldn't want people to say at my funeral. I, would, I don't want them to say this. Man, who would have thought the very first time and his chute didn't open? I mean, wow. Like, I don't, wanna, I don't want that to be spoken. Or how about this one? Man, I thought that guy would never die. Jeez. <laughs> Uh, or maybe this, it, it's so sad that he turned away from his faith just last week. That would be the ultimate tragedy, wouldn't it? These funny ones, and then that one wasn't so funny. Um, listen, the reality is this. Sometimes we become so accustomed to the way things are uh, that we don't realize that change should and could happen. We grow accustomed, uh, just think of your home for a minute or where you live. Maybe you get accustomed to that dark hallway or that peeling paint or that outdated uh, bathroom or that carpet that needs to be replaced, but you've just lived with it so long you don't even really notice it, right? Uh, that light that doesn't work and that car that has sat in your front yard, yard and hasn't run for years. That's not intended for any one person here today, all right? But we grow accustomed to the, to the way the things are, and we get used sometimes to things being the way that they are rather than what they could and should be. And I think that's where the Lord kind of comes in and says, no, you can do better than this. Let's get back on the tracks. Let's do this. Let's, let's live your life the way it's meant to be lived. Um, maybe it's a mess, you think, but it's our mess. And maybe it's broken, but we just haven't got around to fixing it. And, and I want to encourage you, think about uh, somebody else walking through your home. Think about a realtor coming in and saying, let's, let's get this fixed up to sell it. And you and I need to realize in our lives that there's times that we have to reset and restart and, and take uh, inventory and make some changes. 
Listen, if the wireless doesn't work in your home, you go and reset it so it works right. And sometimes we have to do that with our lives, to recognize the Creator has a fantastic plan. And when we get out of alignment, we get re-lined up with Him. So let me ask this question. Do you recognize the need for change in your life? Do you recognize there's a need for change in your life? Or you're like, well, it's kind of always been this way. Yeah, I know it should be different. It should be better. It's kind of run down, but oh well. Don't get comfortable with the way things are. There's always something that God's speaking and doing in your life. Make some changes. Take inventory. Listen, it's never too late to start again and start over. By the way, not everybody has a a legacy that blesses generation after generation. In fact, if you really stop and think about it, many people are barely remembered, sometimes even decades after they die. And there's sadness uh, about that. How many of us know well our great-grandparents? Some of us, we don't even know the names of our great-grandparents. Like, who are they? Um, Listen, I want to leave a legacy of faith. I don't really care if they remember my name or not, as long as I impacted the world long beyond when I was here. I want to impact the world, especially in faith. Um, If you don't get a plaque at the end of this life, but you go to heaven, you win, right? You win. So I I want to use this phrase today, and I want to talk about outliving your life. How can we outlive our lives? There's four things that I want to just go over real quick, how to outlive your life. Number one, learn from history, because if we don't, that's obviously a bad, bad way to go. Number two, sacrifice deeply for a cause. Number three, influence uh, the next generation. Is there any better way to impact the world long after you're gone than to touch the lives of kids and young people all around you? And then number four, pour your life into others. Just be every day look to pour your life into others. So the first point is this, learn from history. Look back on your life. Look back on the lives of others. I like to read and watch uh, biographies and learn from others. It's so important. In fact, um, this, this week I thought, you know, I want to learn from someone else in the message. And so I interviewed my friend Pete Bowdish, uh, who's part of our church, an elder in our church. And I just think that he's uh, poured into a lot of people as we're talking about. I want to learn from his life. So I shot a quick video, and I want to just uh, let you hear from someone who I think has, is leaving a legacy, certainly in this church, in my life, and many others. So would you guys show that video? So I'm here with my friend Pete. And Pete, thanks yeah. for being here. Yeah. So um, what we want to do is we want to take a moment today. The message title is Recalibrate Your Legacy. So I thought it'd be fun to ask you some questions about, you know, how you plan to leave a legacy and what that even means to leave a legacy in your life. It means something that I can put in or encourage some other people to Mm -hmm. live Mm -hmm. for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And it goes on beyond my lifetime in their life. Mm -hmm. I pray that God will give me that moment when I can speak to somebody and I'm prompted in the spirit that goes beyond the words what they are saying to me. Mm -hmm. It's easy to say that, good morning, how are you? And everybody says, I'm fine, you know. But sometimes the spirit of God prompts you that there is something else going beyond the words. Mm -hmm. And you take the time to say, to dig a little deeper maybe. Yeah, so let me ask you this question. If somebody were to say, you know, I want to improve the legacy that I'm leaving to my family or to the world or the city, the church that I'm in, what words of encouragement would you say, hey, you know, if you're gonna leave a legacy that's gonna outlive your life, yes. you know, here's what I would encourage you to do. What would you say to that? Be willing to listen to the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm prompting and then be willing to take risks mm-hmm. when he does. Yeah. There have been times when I could have spoken that I didn't, but mm-hmm. I knew afterwards, mm-hmm. why didn't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. Well, I have seen Sunday mornings where you've spoken into my life or I'll see you speaking to someone else. And I can tell, you know, there's some Holy Spirit things happening in the lobby or in the hallway or in the coffee shop, just as much as what's happening in the sanctuary. It does. Because you're looking for that opportunity (laughs) and the Holy Spirit's using it. And then when you, you, what it is, it doesn't have, you don't have to be old to learn that, Mm -hmm. to learn, you you take those risks sometimes, but pray, read the word, be ready. Yeah. And listen. Yeah, and whether it's praying with somebody on the street or pouring into somebody at church, it's all about people. It is. It's you know? about people. Because some of us, we're living our lives about things and tasks and jobs and 
think we get so busy with those things, Pete, that sometimes we miss the opportunity. There's somebody right in front of you that God wants you to pour His Spirit into. That's right. That's right. So, Very good. Yeah. So you're learning. <laughs> <laughs> I learned well. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> awesome. I love it. That's awesome. I love when somebody in their 90s tells you you should risk more. But, you know, they've done studies, and one of the, the top three things that people say towards the end of their lives is, I wish I would have risked more. And so maybe you need to take that to heart. And I really love what Pete said about living your life uh, following the promptings of the Holy Spirit and, and looking to impact someone. You know, not everybody comes to church. Not everybody goes to the grocery store looking to uh, maybe be used by God to bless or encourage someone else. But some of us do. And I find people like that are are really living dynamic, God-centered lives, and they're changing the world. They're leaving a legacy. Can I challenge you, uh, when you come to a gathering, if you do come live or where you go to work, that you're just looking for an opportunity to be used by God wherever you are. That's legacy living, and it's fantastic. So, Pete, thank you so much for sharing and pouring into my life. Uh, Pete was born in, in 1929. The stock market crashed when he was born. It brought on the Great Depression, but it's not how you start. It's how you finish, my friend. So, uh, thank you for sharing with us. I love it. Man. How to outlive your life. Learn from history. Point number two is this. Sacrifice deeply for a cause. Uh, You outlive your life when you make an impact on others, and usually that requires sacrifice. I'm going to invite Pastor Dave to come up because he has shared a story with me that every time I hear it, I just think it's incredible. So, Pastor Dave, come share that story uh, with us. The first 18 years of my life, I attended Crossroads Church in Raymond, and then later I became the youth pastor there for five years. There was a lady in the church, her name is Dorothy Lunsford. Now, Dorothy Lunsford's name may not mean anything to you, but it means everything to me. You see, Dorothy Lunsford was my oldest daughter's second grade Sunday school teacher. She was my second grade Sunday school teacher, and she was my mother's second grade Sunday school teacher. By the way, my mom is now 86 years old. Dorothy Lunsford taught Sunday school for 60 years. And everyone that she taught, she treated them as if they were her children. You see, her and her husband could not have children of their own. Dorothy also shared the same birthday as me and my twin brother. And yet she would often send us birthday cards and even bake us a cake. That was just kind of the person that she was. In her classroom, Peter, there was a large, empty coffee can. And she would ask us, who do you think Jesus loves? And then she would have the class, one at a time, say, I want you to go look inside that large, empty coffee can. And so one at a time, we would look inside there. And you know what was inside that large, empty coffee can? was a mirror. Through her life, she taught hundreds of kids of Jesus' love, and I'm fortunate to be one of them. And she made a huge impact on my life. Thank you, Pastor Dave. What a story. Six decades. There's somebody in the back like, I tried teaching Sunday school for three weeks. That was hard. <laughs> Six decades. You know, I think about the sacrifice, I think the time spent preparing. I think of spending your own money on making cakes and, and supplies and all the things that those people have done. And when you get to heaven, you never go, oh, I wish I hadn't sacrificed for God. Of course you're thrilled that you did that. What an incredible story of living your life as a legacy. Other people have left a legacy. C.S. Lewis, of course, left a legacy of wisdom, of being a writer, a theologian. He said this, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Uh, He said, um, aim at earth and you will get neither. (laughs) You won't get heaven, but you won't even get earth if you aim at earth. 
I thought about this. I was thinking about legacies, and I know some people have really sewn heavily into the world and into the church. And I thought about the Lilly Foundation. I had heard this, this Lilly Endowment. So I looked it up. I actually emailed the people this week. And the Lilly Endowment was founded in 1937 by J.K. J.K. Lilly Sr., his sons Eli and J.K. Jr., this, is, this was their purpose in 37, the promotion and support of religious, educational, and charitable purposes. Um, Eli Lilly said, I, I hope that we could improve the character of the American people. Our founders uh, viewed character and human development in the context of community, and they encouraged unselfish concern for the welfare of others. They placed uh, um, value on philanthropy. And it was in large part motivated by their religious faith. When I looked them up, I found out that just this last uh, month, they gave $100 million, just $100 million, uh, to inner city uh, um, Indianapolis. And then uh, just in September, they uh, saw what the effect of churches or had on the pandemic had on churches. And they gave $93 million to churches. What an incredible like, legacy of giving. Like, the guy is long gone, but the foundation lives on, impacting the world because of the decisions they made. Incredible giving. I think about the Reverend Martin Luther King. I like this quote. It's not one of the popular ones, but he said, The end of life is not to be happy, not, nor to achieve pleasure or avoid pain, but to do the will of God, come what may. Man, that's, that's a good way to live, to do the will of God, come what may. Uh, two other people from the Bible, uh, one is Moses and one is uh, Jochebed. And, and Moses is kind of easy, you know, he's God's deliverer of his people, the rescuer, you know, in the exodus, he, he calls them out, he rescues them from, from Egypt. And everything that, that Moses does, man, he's special from birth, and he's got a call in his life. By the way, you don't want that call on your life. Some people are like, I want to do, you know, I don't know if you really want to be called. You better, like, sometimes we actually say in ministry, if you could do anything else and be happy, then do that. <laughs> Um, because when Moses was called, it was definitely not going to be an easy life. Hardship, but what a legacy that he left. And then there's Jochebed. And some of you are going, Jochebed, was that an Old Testament king or was that a prophet? Who was he? He was actually Moses' mother. It was a she, right? Some of you know the story of Jochebed. We're going to look today a little bit into her life. You give your Bible, Exodus chapter 2. Um, the setting is this. Pharaoh has decreed that if a Hebrew baby was born and it was male, it was to be killed. But if it was female, it would be allowed to live. It was genocide at its worst. And it happened in those days all the time. The Egyptians were, of course, worried that the Israelite slaves were beginning to have too many numbers, especially uh, the males. You would think, well, we want more slaves and more people to build for us. But they were worried about the numbers. And so they were doing population control over the Israelite slaves in their land. Pharaoh was ordering the midwives to kill the children, and she said, but the Israelites are not like the Egyptians. They have babies really fast. And so Pharaoh um, had to get more serious. He gave this order first um, in uh, Exodus chapter 1, um, verse 22. Pharaoh gave this order to all the people, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. Imagine that, being thrown into the river to drown as a newborn. Moses was called by God to do something for the people of God, to serve humanity, to serve God's church. Point number three is this, influence the next generation. Moses is incredible. We talk about him a lot, but I want to just take a moment and consider what his mother did. If you have a Bible, Exodus chapter 2, verse 1 says this, About this time, when the boys are being thrown into the river, a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. Verse 3, But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket. It says she got a basket made of papyrus reeds, and she waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. Can you imagine taking your three-month-old and putting them in a basket and pushing them out on the river because they're coming to take the boy's life? Listen, Moses' mom did whatever she could to give him a chance at life. It wasn't all up to her, but she could give him a chance, a fighting chance at life. She loved him enough to save his life, to give him up. Listen, you want to outlive your life? Set the next generation up for success. Some days I actually just say, Lord, today's shot. I'm just going to set tomorrow up for success. 
I'm going to do the dishes, do everything I can, so when I wake up tomorrow, it's a better day. How much wiser to realize, Lord, whatever my life is or isn't for the rest of my life, I want to set the next generation up to be more successful than us. All it takes is for one generation to get a me attitude. And the church can crumble in seasons in history. It has. Listen, lay down your life for your kids and your grandkids. Invest into other people's kids in, in this world. In our church, there have been so many hundreds of people, thousands of people sacrificing, giving, and serving, and teaching Sunday school. Listen, parents, when you lay your life down for your kids, you are imitating Christ. When you lay your life down for the church, for lost people, you are imitating Christ. The scripture says this in verse 4, the baby's sister stood at a distance watching to see what would happen following that basket. Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river and her attendants walked along the river bank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. Here's point number four today. Pour your life into others. Just absolutely pour your life into others. Just pour yourself out. You would think, I'm going to keep as much as me and me for me. That will make you miserable. When you pour your life into other people, it gives you significance. It gives you joy. It gives your life meaning. And you can't have meaning in your life if you don't pour it into others. You have to do this. We want to be a part of something bigger. We want to make a difference. It's the human condition. It's built in. It's hardwired into our souls to be that person who makes everybody feel like a somebody. To be with people sometimes at the worst moments of their lives. Listen, what you do for yourself dies with you. But what you do for others lives on in others. Who is your favorite teacher as you look back on your life? Chances are that person, she poured her life or he poured his life into you and to others. Pouring your life into others will cost you greatly. There's two things I know. If you live your life for yourself, you'll die miserable. But if you pour your life into others, you will leave a legacy. And that's what we really want to do. Pouring your life into others means trusting them to the Lord. Verse 6, when the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the little the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Okay, that was gutsy, approaching Pharaoh's daughter. And she said, should I go find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Man, everybody deserves a big sister like that. I had a couple. They would have said, do you want to just push him down the river? (laughs) But this older sister, do you want me to go find someone to nurse the baby for you? Verse 7 and 8, yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. This is a part of the story I think is so incredible. Can you imagine Moses' mother, her heart is breaking, beating out of her chest, putting her child in the basket, pushing it out, praying that he gets to live, praying that he's not drowned that day or found by by the Egyptians. To go from that and then realizing her son's going to live. But not just that, that she is going to nurse her own son. And the best part, she's going to get paid for it. (laughs) Crazy. What did she think about when she looked into that little boy's eyes? I knew you were special. I gave you a chance at life. And of all people, Pharaoh's daughter finds you and gives you back to me to raise, to nurse. (sighs) Surely she could never have known how she would outlive her life through the child as he became God's chosen leader for his people, for millions. What did she say to her child? What did she speak to her child? I think she spoke words of blessing over that that baby. I I want to encourage you to speak words of blessing over the next generation. Verse 9 says this, Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will, pay you, um, I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby, her own baby, home and nursed him. Um, and then it says this, Later when the boy was older, this is the hard part, the mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh, though, the one that turned her people into slaves. And she adopted him as her own son. And the princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. She gave her three-year-old son to the wealthy, to the godless slave drivers, and the aristocrat family. Does this make sense to you? Imagine the roller coaster. My son is going to die, all because we're slaves, all because he happens to be male. Now my son is saved. 
Now I get to nurse my son. I get paid for it. I get to raise him for three years. But here's the heart-wrenching moment I have to give him to Pharaoh's daughter. She did something that most of us wouldn't have been able to do once, and she did it twice. She gave up her son. She trusted that God would protect Moses and use him in a special way. I got to tell you, it's really hard to trust God to protect that which you love, isn't it? I'd love to just say trusting God is easy, but it's hard. You know the world that we live in. Lord, would you protect my kids when I can't be there? If God asks you to give something up that you hold dear, trust him and release it. God knows the full story. God is trustworthy. Amen? Trust him. Lord, I don't have to understand, but I do have to trust you with my life. So listen, if you really want to outlive your life, there's four things we talked about. But the best way I really know to com- is to completely surrender your life to God. Lord, I was given life. I'm not exactly sure why. You created me. You put a soul in me. So God, I want to do everything, absolutely everything in my power to accomplish your will, your purpose for my life. As you think about the legacy you're leaving today, would you also think, you know, there's some changes I want to make. I don't want to leave a legacy of anger. I don't want to leave relationships behind that are not right. I don't want people to come to my funeral and go, I hope there's good food afterwards. I want to touch the world, impact the world. When my time comes, I want to know I poured myself out for others. Would you live your life not for yourself, but for God and living to impact people? When it comes down to it, It's people that matter the most. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me for just a few minutes as we close? We're coming to the end of this entire series about recalibrating your life. Examining where you are. Determining where you want to be and then making some changes. It is possible to sit through an entire sermon series and make no changes. But I don't think that's what you want. God had a purpose for Jacobed. God has a purpose for you. Do you recognize the changes that the Lord wants you to make in your life? Are you outliving your life? Listen, are you learning from history, both yours and others? Are you sacrificing deeply for a cause? Most of all, the kingdom of God. Are you influencing the next generation? You don't have to have kids. Are you pouring into the next generation? Are you pouring your life into others? Looking to make an impact. Lord, if there's someone here and you've called them to make an impact through their giving, I pray, God, that they would get so much joy out of the legacy of giving to change the world around them. Lord, if there's someone here who's supposed to be making an impact on the next generation, life's just got busy. Lord, help each one of us to pour our lives into others. And Lord, if there's something here that we have to trust you with, Lord, if we have to trust you for something that's beyond our control, that scares us to death, It may be our family, it may be our jobs, it may be our finances, it may be our health. But Lord, there are things beyond our control. And Lord, if this woman could give her child away twice and trust that you have a plan, then Lord, perhaps we could trust you as well. Lord, we won't always understand, but we choose to trust you anyway.
Church, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit is whispering to you. If there's something God's asking you to do, if there's something specific that you're going to change, would you just right now even say that to God? Lord, I'm realizing the legacy I have with my grandkids or my kids. Lord, I'm going to use money for your glory. I'm not going to be like the world. Lord, I'm going to serve whether anyone notices and acknowledges me or not. Lord, wherever I go, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to prompt me to speak into others. And I'm going to take some risks for you, God. I want as few regrets as possible life is over. If God has challenged you, would you acknowledge that to the Lord? Lord, we don't understand everything about the times we're living in. We don't know the day and the hour, God, for which you have planned to turn everything right side up. But we do know that we have these days to make an impact we won't have them forever. So God, while we're in this window of life, we choose. In our later years, we choose to pour into your church. In our early years, we choose to pour into your church. And Lord, there's things we can't control and there's things that scare us. And we still choose to pour into your kingdom. God, thank you for your voice, your message your words to us today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Man, God bless you. God be with you. God is for you. And uh, I think we're going to make it together as a family, as a church, all right? Have an incredible week in the Lord.